Hello, everyone. It's Tinderbox Meetup with Michael Becker. I'm Mark Bernstein, the author of Tinderbox, and it is October 27th, 2024, as the world careens towards Armageddon. Uh, next week, I believe we're going to be talking about JSON, the uh, JavaScript interchange format, and how to use it in Tinderbox. So, uh, save your JSON questions for that. As opposed to the Halloween on that this week. As opposed to the Halloween, the Halloween Friday the Thirteenth JSON. Yes, the right. Got it. That that's a different JSON. This is JSON without hockey masks, though. Mark Anderson is not convinced. Um, but without further ado, here's Michael. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome. Uh, our typical format for the meetups is we go around the room and we ask new people to introduce themselves. We don't have anyone new today. Um, we then either dig into a theme, which we don't have today, or we just address people's questions, comments, topics that they're uh, doing and playing with the tool. So uh, with that in mind, it looks like today's agenda is going to be that, jumping in and talking about topics. So let's go around the room and who's got what and who's working on what. Anybody have any particular points they're working on? If not, I always have something to pull out. Yeah, I'll go for it. All right, so I've got one, Mark. Let me go ahead and share my screen and get it right. Um, I've been doing it oh, on here. Let me do it this way. I actually could use some help from the everyone on this one. So I've been... Um, Doing a lot with, let me set the stage here. I hadn't really thought about it until just two seconds ago. Where's my... So I've been writing a report for um, one of my clients and using my um, uh, chat GBT buddy to help me think through and ideate on some concepts, get some general ideas. And so like one of the questions, for instance, I was asking ChatGPT was, you know, give me the definition of the average pricing of the most common top to five features for, say, keylogger encryption. And so what I've been playing with is, you know, um, you know grabbing this and then using this uh, information as kind of a starter to get, getting started with stuff. So let me go ahead here and get this out of the way. Come on. So if you were at a Tinderbox file, create a note. Come on. All right. And um, and I'll kind of show you where this goes at it uh, in just a second. So at this point now, what I can start doing is thinking about how do I want to triage this information and start breaking it up into its little uh, into its atomic pieces so that I can start um, uh, you know making that easier for me to manipulate the individual pieces. So I've been going and adding in. Um, some delimiters. I should do it for these. And this was kind of, and then sometimes I would come in with like a summary. All right. And so then if I hit explode, I can explode at the thing. Now, what's interesting here is I found that I, I want to do it at the uh, paragraph, remove the action. And so now if I do the outline. I've got all of the pieces of that particular thing. Now, the, here's where I get some really interesting things that I wanted to kind of just mention real quick for, for Mark Anderson, I mean, uh, Mark Bernstein. So Mark, if you looked at the original note, I noticed, you know, and I think I, I know the answer because it seems to, it's, it's because it's, it's regex um, processes, but you notice how right out of the gate, these two um, brackets here um, actually triggered uh, for, for whatever, oh, and, oh okay, and here, and there was actually a an extra, um, for whatever reason, um, hashtag there. So that's why I think that broke there. So the question would be, you know, how would, oh, if I, if I did that, let me think about it now as I talk. So if you're playing with regex, if I say that I only want to break at the front of the line and I do it again, then I don't get that broken area. So it ignores, so the red, so in playing with the regex, what that does by adding that carrot, 
that make that suggests the it will ignore that that hashtag there. So that 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 actually worked. And then the question, one of the questions I had from a regex perspective, I move up here, get this out of the notes, was then I wanted what I was trying to do is I wanted to extract um, this pricing detail. So if you had a dollar sign and a number, and then a dollar sign and a number, and then Previously, I had it like this per year. So if I had a pattern like that and I wanted to extract that out of the text, so let me just copy that. And let's say I had this be the note. And then I had, um, we'll add some attributes here. Uh, pricing, lower range, pricing, upper range, billing period. So what I wanted to be able to do here, and let's make this a number. This one's a number, number, and a set. Okay, so I've got these new attributes here. And then what I wanted to do is do the regex that would, that would parse this out. So I was playing with the regex using BB edit. And here's my pattern playground. And so if you look at the pattern, a dollar sign, the word two, a space, the number, the slash, and the billing period, I see that this regex appears to work. And now watch it work now as I do it. So if I get my, so if I do this, and essentially what this regex is saying is go to the dollar sign, grab any number, any number plus any number of characters up to, up to a space, then grab the next set of numbers, turn that into a, um, what do you call it, Mark, in regex? Do you call it a reference or back reference? It's back reference. Oh, you're on mute. Okay, back reference. And then grab the rest of the characters in the line. That's basically the, the, the two. Then again, grab the next dollar sign, grab its first characters, grab the dot, grab the, the numbers after that. And then um, grab all of the characters after that. So these are, these give me the, elements that I'm looking for, which are, which are essentially upper loan, upper price, uh, or excuse me, lower price, upper price, and billing period. So if I grab that regex and I go and create a stamp. Now, for some reason, Mark Bernstein, I could not get this to work for the life of me, but watch it work now. Um, extract prices. So if I say um, if name dot I contains that pattern, then what do I want you to do? And what I want it to do is I want it to make pricing upper upper lower range equal to dollar sign one. And for those that are interested, we'll explain this in more detail once I get it working. Pricing. Come on. For range, I think it was dollar sign. Double doors. Dollar sign two and double ors. Yeah, it's meant just meant three and four. Okay. Uh, you're right. Yeah. So three and this would be four. Okay. So if I do this right, that should extract out and it doesn't. And I don't know why. So I'm trying Nor to. Nor do I. Uh, my guess is that you need to escape the backslashes, but I don't know. Uh, this is easier for me to do if I have a little bit of lead time and can look at it. But in the meantime, how would you do this with the streaming interface? Okay, well, we could do that too. So let's experiment with that in just a second. But um, you know, when, you, when you say the, the backslashes, what do you mean? It, I contains. Um, I believe you need to double the backslashes because backslash is a special character to Tinderbox. 
Got it. That could work. Let's see if that works. And we'll explain to people what that means in just a second if this actually works. All right. No. Okay. Uh, I don't know, but. All right. Well, let me drop it in the chat. And at some point, if someone knows how to play with this, where's chat? That's that, and then that's the string. And you know, I had like I had to do it like thirty times to like manually parse it out. So I figured I'd try to automate it if I could, but couldn't figure it out. That's actually um, not necessarily a great trade off unless you're going to need to do this thirty times every month. No, I agree. Um, I agree. But it was, so it was a combination of. I spent like 10 minutes trying to figure it out. And then I said, forget it. I'll just manually do it 30 times. But the odds of me having to do it again at some point in the future were high enough for me to want to play with regex. Mm -hmm. But you're, you're right. It was on that balanced edge of doing that. But that's the, um, that was, you know, giving you know, while we're at the, the regex plane though. So the goal was to help have Tinderbox help me kind of automatically parse the other information. So for those that are watching, here's some other fun things to, that that can be doing here. So I can go ahead and um, I'll show you an example of what I also did with the explode. So I also figured I identified that a lot of my text had these bullets here. So what I would do is when I exploded it, I would say text equals text equals text dot replace and then I take the bullets and then replace them with an asterisk so I can get my markdown and so if I do it that way type on oh, replace oh I spelled replace wrong you're right did it again there you go and explode that. And so then by doing that, I'm getting my bullets. Now, for some reason, it didn't delete this. Oh, I know. It should have deleted the spaces. Let's try it again. Text equals. Try that again. Yeah, it's um, it's not deleting the spaces for some, that that level. Of those oh, uh, is it? Is there a space there? I don't know. So what you could do? I here, don't believe there's a space there. I think the indentation uh, is being supplied by quick lists. Oh, uh, that could be. If you don't want, you can turn off. I actually, I think it though is because I pasted it in from um from uh, ChatGPT. So I actually think it's tabs. So here's, I'll show you a tip for everyone. Another way to figure that out is if you open up a BB edit file. And remember tab is a different character from space. Right, so if I do that and paste the, okay, okay, so yeah. So it looks like it's, um, it's a tab. Backslash Not, T. Paul yeah. Christie, what have you got? You know, um, I, in my use of Tinderbox daily now, probably the feature I use most often is Explode. Um, it, it is just such a handy feature and it comes up kind of constantly when dealing with text. Uh, as, I'm, as I'm using it, I haven't found anything like that in any other software package. Is it a copyrighted feature? Is it just unique? Is I've tried to duplicate it in Keyboard Maestro, for example, in DevonThink, and it's a mess. Um, but it's just so handy. It's it's not copyrighted. It's just a endemic to Tinderbox. Um. Um, it, it's an interesting point. I mean, it's a very old Tinderbox and Story Space feature. Uh, I can't say it's been particularly beloved. Uh, and it hasn't been 
particularly easy to write. Uh, but uh, no, it, I can't recall. I don't know where they got it. It was in, uh, it, it, as far as I know, Bolter and Joyce put it together as part of a writing exercise for uh, Joyce's community college students. And yeah, it is handy. What kind of texts are you importing? Um, I would, well, Go ahead, Paul. Sorry, not me. Yeah, it's not for me. Not a question for me, right? No, I thought no. that was for you. I think it was. Oh, okay. I mean, what, you what know, sort I, of texts? I, I typically these days am taking meeting notes. And so more and more often I will put, just turn on my iPhone, take a voice memo, uh, throw it to Matt Whisper, which, you know, gives me a whisper perfect <laughs> uh, transcription. Um, I dump that as big as it is into uh, a tinderbox text field and start to go at it. You know, I'd like to say I'm really good with regex and, you know, I, I perfectly break all my points where, where regex would tell me to. Uh, more often, I just sit there like Michael did and I put hash marks in there where I want things to break and then I split it into a document and, and have at it. It, it uh, you know, that process can take uh, uh, an hour's worth of meeting notes and give me a realistic uh, outline in 30 minutes. It's very helpful. That's my typical use. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And since there's always going to be another meeting, uh, having a way to streamline that is nice. Since they're hand-built, you can't really make it a push the button and it's done sort of thing. But Interesting. Yep. Well, and again, that's where I find the starting to get more and more of the flexibility and the comfort. So to your point, if it's just 30 times once, then it's not really worth the energy or effort to figure out the regex. But as I was explaining, sometimes it is to be able to learn the regex. So then once you kind of start figuring out the regex patterns, then it, it you know, you can start getting faster and faster parsing stuff out in, in real time. You know, and, and responding to new patterns pretty quickly. So I, I, I definitely worth our one's time to experiment with that. So you like Mac Whisper, huh? You know, I do. I, I uh, stumbled onto it and uh, it has, it's kind of daily updated. I don't know who maintains it, but they they tinker with it a lot. Um, but it's now got direct links to, to the OpenAI interface so you can um, transcribe something fairly large, immediately send it to uh, um, chat GPT within the app itself and um, get a series of paragraph breaks or topic breaks or tasks involved, you know, a bunch of things like that. It's not free, but uh, I've, I've found that it's uh, it's generally worth paying for. Do you, do you have a URL for it? Uh, let me look it up and throw it into the chat. Into, I mean, if you Google went Mac Whisper, obviously. You'll I've got it. it. Yeah. Got it. Nice. All right. Yeah, so I find the explode feature really, really helpful. Um, and then just to kind of, I can demonstrate to people. Let me find my file again and I'll show you. Uh, because when I can projects, yeah, here it is. And then I can demonstrate some other fun elements that I did along the path here. Okay, so part of it again, it's not, you know, yeah, when go ahead. Sorry, I don't want to. Um so I was just going to comment on the, sort of the historical question about why more apps don't include this kind of thing. Um, uh, and I think that, so for programming, like if you're a programmer uh, or if you use the, the shell on Unix or Mac systems, yeah, the functionality has sort of been there with the, the raw building blocks to do it yourself pretty easily for a long, long time. There's a split command that can take a regular expression, essentially does that. Um, for it. That's not the greatest interface, but it's pretty functional um, if, if you're used to doing things yourself. Uh, and 
then the problem is that to get into other applications to make it really interesting, I think you do need regular expressions. And so you need to be addressing an audience where that's going to be okay. Uh, and Tinderbox is clearly in that category, but few tools are willing to go there if they're simpler. Um, you know, an outline manager or something might do that. Um, uh, but uh, when you start getting people to, to do regular expressions, they have to want to do it. Just a thought. Oh, and and so you're saying the the concept of explode or splitting text was originally part of kind of the Unix core. Uh, the, well, the I don't know where the concept originated, but the there's been a tool, a command line tool to do it for uh, approximately forever. Um, uh, and in the Unix world, doing things with regular expressions is a pretty obvious thing to do. Probably the original version of split didn't do that um, uh, for it. Uh, and so the, uh, you know, I've been taking large files like split into to things like this uh, sort of uh, uh, outside of Tinderbox for, for a long, long time for all the obvious reasons. Well, yeah, and, and regex was what? It was built, I can't remember the guy's name who did it. He, sometime in the 50s, I think, is when regex was a, a Yeah, the, 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 the idea was invented in, in the 50s. Um, I, I think it really, um, uh, Unix was probably the system that made it really start to be common, um, in part because Ken Thompson, who was one of the creators of uh, Linux, did one of the, a, a good, efficient algorithm implementation for it. Um, because sort of figuring out how to do that was kind of hard. Yeah. So it looks like it was de developed by a guy named Stephen Cole Clean in the 50s. Yeah. And then, and then to your point, came into use with Unix text processing utilities. Cool. And then what's this, Mark? Uh, string process. What's AW? Oh, AWOC. Okay. Uh, there was also a language called Snowball, S-N-O-B-O-L, as in COBOL, in the early 60s, but it didn't uh, become particularly popular. Did Snowball implement plain style regular expressions, Mark? I don't know that it did, uh, but it did things like split. Yeah. So, Dave, Paul, to answer your question, it's been around a long time. <laughs> They're poss possibly not patentable. Uh, I guess the implementation of it would be in a particular ind individual piece of software, but maybe not for copyrightable at least. But, but okay, I, I don't think that it's a. Uh, I, I I think it's because it's at the awkward space between things that are programming like and things that aren't yeah. programming like. And the sensation that uh, regular users cannot accept things that feel like programming, and people who can program will not accept anything that isn't procedural. It's mm -hmm. also complicated in practice now by the fact that there are still several common varieties of regular expressions that overlap in how they work. So getting your notation right, if you're switching among them, is a real pain. Yeah. But I've been working on one last chapter for the book that will be coming out real soon, uh, thinking with Tinderbox that actually deals with exactly this topic. Where do uh, streams come from? Uh, not right, regular expressions. It's a different chapter, but um, where do streams come from and what are they really about? Cool. All right. Um, if nobody else has anything else, I can show something else until somebody pops some other point of conversation up. So one of the things I was working on yesterday, so for one of my um, clients, I was working on this idea of... Um, trying to just understand the tools that we need to use uh, uh, to um, essentially, uh, yeah, Win, go ahead. Is your name still up, name still up, or is it something different? Oh, it came down. Okay, so um, kind of my task for this project was, um, you know, ideate and think through the tools that we need to use to, um, protect us from a cyber in the, in the world of cybersecurity, our new digital selves. 
Um, and I think I've explained this with you all before at some point, uh, but the, the concept of thinking with Tinderbox, what I, what I really liked about this is, you know, I've been working in this field for a long time. So I'm, I'm very aware of the tools that are out there. And that's where I really find interfacing with uh, uh, you know, um, AI models and ChatGPT really, really useful because I'm fairly cognizant of the, of the field. So when I interact with ChatGPT or an LLM model, I can look at its answers and pretty convinced, you know, pretty confidently know is the information it's giving me generally correct or is it total BS or somewhere in the middle? And then I can leverage that information I'm getting from the LLM models. So I could say like, hey, ChatGPT, can you give me the top five um, you know, um, providers for uh, password managers and their URLs? And me, rather than me having to waste time trying to remember them, I have ChatGPT give me the list and then I can go through the list and say, okay, yeah, these are the top five. So um, I've, been, I've been able to do that quite a bit. But so my, the uh, framework that I was using um, for doing this, and I think I've explained this before, is um, in um, you know, meditating one day on the idea of Buddha's, Buddha's Four Noble Truths, which result in one being able to achieve the pathway to enlightenment through the application of what's called the Eightfold Path or appropriate living. Um, I adopted this model for cybersecurity um uh, for for all of us in the in our fidgetal being what i call the fivefold path so in order for us to enrich fidgetal sovereignty this ability to have this enlightened state of over over our personal data and identity in the marketplace you know i believe that we you need these kind of seven elements one being uh, awareness um changing in behaviors both physical and digital adopting the professional services and support um the you know enacting of your social civic commercial and government rights um, and then the, uh, you know, uh, adopting active and passive technologies. And so as I was kind of uh, building out and working through this framework, I started thinking about like, well, what are the active technologies that we need to use or what are the passive technologies that we need to have in our lives um, to be able to really take control over our, uh, over our identity and personal data. And, um, and, then, and this is where thinking with Tinderbox got really, really fun because I started thinking about, okay, well, what's the information that I need to know? Or and this was kind of incrementally evolving over a couple of days as I was pulling pulling this report together. So obviously, I wanted pricing. Um, I wanted a list of the common features. And again, I've done previous work where I manually did this a couple of years ago, and I developed a uh, the common set of features across about three three thousand different cybersecurity products. Uh, and identified, you know, um, about 750 common features across all of those different products. Uh, and then so when I was using ChatGB for this exercise, I'm like, hey, ChatGB, just really quick, grab me the top five features or top seven features for this product because I didn't need any more at this point. And because of my experience with that, I was ab actually able to know whether or not those were actually uh, correct or not. And so that's where um, um, this idea of thinking with Tinderbox becomes really helpful. So let me pull up ChatGBT and show you that example like I did before, where I could say, um, where because I'll start a new chat just to show it. I could say, um, can you give me a description for password managers, five to seven key features, average pricing, Uh, and a 10 to 15 word tagline that follows this format. Um, uh, you get this benefit by XYZ. See Michael, that? before you hit enter, you have work, not word. Where I am. And then what I've also found that ChatGPT totally likes get you know ignores my typos and things like that and does what I ask it to do. It's actually pretty good. Nirvana. <laughs> uh, so when I when I do that, you know, I get that I get that brief description. I get my key features. I get the, um, uh, those elements there. I then have my average pricing that comes out, and then I get the tagline. So you get effortless security by storing unautofilling complex passwords with ease. 
So that, you know, you know, it really, really kind of, and again, I'm not necessarily using all of this verbatim, but I find it just super helpful for not having to deal with a blank page um, or, or coming up, uh, coming up with it with scratch. And so then I was demonstrating before I could copy this manually one, one by one, or in the, in the case of like this, extracting out these features, this is a great example of leveraging regex. And if, and if you're all interested, we could, you know, go through that exercise right now and demonstrate how you can um, uh, build a regex that grabs uh, that, you know, captures the, the bolded elements as the name and extracts this element as text. So there's a variety of different ways that go about doing that too. So we could we could experiment with that if you were all interested. But I'll show you the outcome of after several hours of work while I was doing this is that I was able to um, grab, you know, so I was able to grab my descriptions and then rewrite them to my to my needs, get my pricing, get my pricing features. Uh, and then this is where I kind of make a combination of standard timber tinderbox templates and then the effective use of uh, export code so to mark uh, mark bernstein's point earlier so at some point you got to make the toss off uh, the toss up of is it worth the effort of spending the time to automate something or do you just do it manually and i'll give you a great example of what i do that with here so um, you know, and I'll just go ahead and delete this real quick and shape. So previously I had this as the description of my, um, of my notes. And so if I was just looking at the output I was having for a password manager and here are the providers. Um, and this is where it kind of, again, the combination. So I've got a list of companies and then I have the URL for those companies. And then I've all shown you before, but I've created a template that looks at um, if I check is no show children and is yes list children, what that does is that automatically looks at the children of a note. And then what my templates will do is automatically bullet, put those notes into, into a bulleted list. Or if I actually check the numbered list, and I'll demonstrate that now, would actually put it into a numbered list. And then if there is a URL in the note, the uh, my uh, my bulleted list uh, template, which again, if you guys are interested, I can deconstruct that now and we can go over it again, um, is such that it will automatically create the bulleted list or create the numbered list. And then if there's a URL, it will actually highlight the URL of that of that company. So I've got that in the bulleted list. So I just find that automation. And if I uncheck that is yes numbered list, I then can turn it into a bulleted list. So I find just that automation um, from my templating functionality just enormously helpful for the type of writing that I that I do here. Um, so with that, and then if I and then if you see like here, I don't actually have any text for those, but I, I can demonstrate this. Let's say I were to actually have just to demonstrate this one more. Let's say we're actually have some text in that note too. The way I've set up my text, my uh, my uh, if I say yes, include the text as well then Tinderbox actually adds the text to the bulleted list. And those are all, uh, it's all templated function <laughs> functionality that, that I built for myself. So in, in, in doing that, I was able to then say, okay, great. Here's the, the details of, uh, uh, of that particular product. So I was able to, you know, to, to Mark uh, Bernstein's point, this idea of thinking with Tinderbox, what I, what I really like in this kind of, writing linear map, you know, and all the different views that Tinderbox gives me is it does allow me to think, and then I can start summarizing what I need to say, start to create the PowerPoints for, um, you know, for a client, because a lot of enterprise clients don't want these long lists of, uh, uh, you know, these long hundred page reports. What they want is the 10 page summary report. And so from that, you can start building tables. And so I'll demonstrate something real quick. So one of the things I was thinking about is, I wanted to be able to pull out values, um, you, know, you know, into my output without having to spend the time to actually write a new template for this particular context. And um, yeah, so it, you know, so I didn't want to spend the time to have to write a whole new template for this particular context. So I decided I wanted to leverage um, export code uh, that you can do inherently within a note and in a note's context. Um, and so again, let me you know, give you an example of that. So I have a template out here, I'll show you this. Come on. You know, I have a template I call my, my, my main, 
template is called um, you know, page be T page Becker R2, and everything processes through that. And I, you know, and I've gotten to a point now where a lot of my work has gotten fairly templatized like this. So I find sometimes if I if I'm not going to do it over and over again a lot, and for this just particular report, I wanted to customize my output a bit, you can actually build export code right into the text of a note. And there's part of me that kind of bristles when I do that because I like maintaining this concept of atomic notes. Like this is the title password and this is the description of a password manager. Um, but there are other times just out of efficiency, I need to get the job done. So you can use what's called the value export code. So if I go like this and I type in the body of a text and I say the export code of value, and I type the word tagline, right? What that's gonna do is that's going to pull the, 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 the value of the attribute tagline into the body of the text. So if I, if I present that, you'll now see prevents password reuse. And then I could go ahead here and say tagline like that. And then if I wanted to use my markdown syntax to bold that. So this kind of breaks, this kind of breaks my cardinal rule that I've talked about a lot in the previous videos of separating content from structure and appearance. But in this context, I need to get the job done. I don't need to overly engineer it at this moment. And so I'm going to kind of intermix some content and, and, and structure. Yeah, Art. So, yeah, okay, sorry if I'm jumping maybe a touch ahead, but my question is, um, could there be a way to abstract the export code from the text field in the sense that you might have a note that contains only export code and uh, the textualized note would be a child of that note that contains only export code and you could have the... Yeah, you could. And let me demonstrate that to you in just a minute. Awesome. And just show you how that and just show you how that would work because there there is a there's a nice little trick with that. Um, by the way, okay. too, I had no plan at all for what we talk about today. So if this is coming off a little um, unplanned, it's because it's I'm just going I'm going by the seat of my pants right now. Um, oh. So 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 another so I'm thinking okay, you know what I want to be able to give my client is some of this highlighted material. So you know here's the here's the tagline that I want to stick in. And then you'll sync up here. I've got uh, you know prioritize strategies. So part of the objective we're trying to do too is how do we prioritize which which of these twenty nine different cybersecurity tools that one might want to uh, uh, an individual or consumer might want to use. Which one of these do we want to first start prioritizing that we're going to give the clients? So then I was thinking, okay, so let's take that same framework and we'll go ahead. And we'll put that in and we'll call it, um, you know, strategies, applicable, we'll call it relevant strategies. Come on. Okay. And then you'll see my prioritizing str um, strategy. Get the spelling right. Prioritization, sorry. Type. Okay, so you'll see here. Now I do that. Now this is an, this is interesting. So I've got it. So I've got my tagline, and then um, I do everything in Markdown. So I'll show you why this is not breaking. This is this is on the wrong line, and then and then you'll notice that I'm actually getting exactly the value of that attribute. And you'll know if we look here, and I'll show you how to. I won't say fix it, but I'll show you how to address that. So if, and I've got hundreds and hundreds of attributes in my files because I don't bother cleaning them out all the time. But if you look to, um, just kind of want to show that, come on. So if you look at the, ah, oh, I'm in OP, where is it? Come on. Got too much open on my computer right now. So, so if you look here, you'll see that prioritizing strategy is a set or it's a list. You, uh, is everyone see that? Art, you got that? Yeah. Okay. So here's the challenge. Now, 
you know, this is a set, to, you know, Tinderbox is doing exactly what I'm asking it to do, pull in the con the value of the information into the note. But obviously from a from a uh, written perspective, you don't separate a list with semicolons without spaces. So what do you do? You can add the operator format. And then I can say what I want Tinderbox to do. And Tinderbox kind of is smart enough to know this. So when I say, what I'm saying is format the list. And since Tinderbox knows that the delimiter in a, a delimiter in a list is a semicolon, essentially what I'm telling it to do is change the semicolon into a comma and a space. So now when I do that, and then and then because I'm doing Markdown, by the way, any any people that want to learn or learn how to write in Markdown, um, Markdown actually wants if you want a space between lines, you actually have to put that space in between lines. If there is no space in between lines, Markdown will will just concatenate lines. Um, so you need to, uh, basically you need two line breaks um, when you're writing Markdown to, to have Markdown say, okay, this is one line and the next line. If not, it will concatenate lines together, like like you saw before. So now what you'll see is I got the bro uh, uh, I got the breakdown of rel um, uh, of relevant, and then you'll notice that the semicolons have now become um, uh, uh, com commas with a space. So this is really. Re this is really, really effective. And so if I wanted it to be anything, let's say I wanted it to be, I don't know, like that. Right? Mm. Um, you yeah. know, it's now it's now that. <laughs> so, yeah. so Tinderbox is really, really nice for you know facilitating the manipulation of your of the values and your attributes in this way. Fascinating. Good one, good one. Okay. And then obviously the next one I want is category. Now, category for me is a set, but because I only have one category in here right now, I don't need to do the formatting. Um, but if I wanted to do it just in case, I, at some point, I do have more than one category, I could just put it in there for a um, a uh, um, sake, and then I can change it to category. But in this, you'll get the comma, right? Even if you have just one no. item? No, no because, there is, because there's, no semicolon, oh, there's right. no semicolon to replace. All right. Yeah, uh, this is where this is where we have to be grateful for Mark Bernstein, and this is where the developer of the software has put a lot years of thought mm. into making this making this useful for us. Uh, yeah, Paul. So clearly, you've got a prototype for your your top level your password managers that indicates that it's to be processed with Markdown. Correct. Yes, because it's not yeah. not visible up front. Yeah, yeah. So for me, and just so you know, a little trick on this too, and I, and I'll demonstrate this to you in a minute. So if you notice, like a typical a, a typical Tinderbox note, um, and again, this is just there is no right or wrong thing to do in Tinderbox. I've just been using this for so long that I've developed some muscle memory capabilities. Um, so like a typical Tinderbox note is this kind of. Tinderbox gray number seven color. So that's that's the color of a, of a typical typical Tinderbox note. Um, I write predominantly in Markdown. Sometimes I'll leave it as a standard note process. So I use the color pink to tell me that this note is in Markdown. Um, and, um, and so I have a stamp and I can show that to you. Uh, and I've set all, and, and again, I've set, and, and because I've gotten so, I, I predominantly write 99% of the time I'm writing a markdown now. Um, so because of that, uh, I have all of my on ads are on adding to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to um, prototypes that use markdown. But you'll notice here, so when I, when I actually, when I am applying a note and I'm telling a, moat, a note to be in markdown, Essentially, what I'm doing is make a color that make its color that pink color. Put the H, H, HTML preview command into command common mark, which is the preview command that tells Markdown uh, tells Tinderbox to actually render in Markdown. It also supports Mark uh, another another rendering engine called Markdown, which you can demonstrate. Um, apply this template, um, and then set your HTML mark up text to false. So that's telling that's another. Not only do you have to set the preview command to mark uh, common mark, you also set the mark up uh, response to false. Then that that's another uh, mechanism of telling Tinderbox that you want to be writing in Markdown. 
Um, set mark the mark uh, tinderbox uh, attribute HTML mark down to true. So I'm I'm swapping the you know write me in, write in HTML to write in markdown, and then um, the syntax highlighting I I just keep uh, blank. Sometimes I use that for other purposes, and then how that renders itself and its its templates is so it's um, swapping this uh, text markup to make it false, and then behind the scenes it's having markdown uh, attribute equal true. So that stamp uh, is what's applying things to markdown. Now I'll show you another another template I have. Um, is one that where I because you all know that I write in Pandoc. So I have another template that says, no, no, no. What I want you to now actually do is make all of these changes. But in this context, let me do this bigger here. In this context, when I when I'm when I when I when I put a node into Pandoc view, I want its color changed to blue. I want the HTML preview command to be changed to the Pandoc string. I want the template to be case. I want markup now to be uh, markup text to be false, markdown text to be true, because I, I have my Pandoc engine rendering markdown. And then I just reset some of the uh, some of these other other commands. And so then if you know, watch me apply this stamp to this note, and I'll go ahead and put an attribute in here. I'll put in like here. Let's say um, at Becker 24. I think it's Q. Can't remember. I'll just do that one. All right. So let's say I have a a, a citation that I put in this note too. So now if I'm telling Tinderbox to render this note in Pandoc, you'll notice that it turns blue. So then visually this tells me as I'm writing, anything in pink is markdown and being rendered by the internal common mark engine in Tinderbox. Anything that is blue is being rendered externally uh, out of Tinderbox using Pandoc. Uh, and so then if I were to render this note now, that note is getting rendered uh, using Pandoc. And because it's being rendered um, using Pandoc, the citation automatically gets converted. And then the uh, and then ultimately the, the reference gets added um, to the to the end of it as well. So that's 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 kind of how that works. It's a very neat trick. Yeah. You know, and OK. Oh, by the way, here, here's another trick, too, which is interesting. Um, you'll notice here. Here's the reference, and then it drops the references here. Do you all oh, see that? Yeah, where is it pulling it from? Well, because because it's Pandoc. Pandoc is rendering, it's, ah. it's looking at the note and rendering the references. The problem, though, and this is, but if you notice, then you've seen all of this other content. Okay? That's up to notes, though, right? Yeah, but and so what the, because here's the thing. What Tinderbox does is it renders a note, so it, it, it serially looks at each note individually as it's going down the outline hierarchy from top to bottom, renders that note, and then moves on to the next note, and then moves on to the next note. And so mm. the template is saying, hey, Tinderbox, go use the template, render the note, which it did dutifully, and, it's, and pan, it saw that this note is in Pandoc, and so it wants it to be um, rendering the references. And then it moves to the next note, pricing, and then it moves to the next note, common features, and then it moves to the next note, provider examples. But what I really want is I want my references to be at the end of the document, not spattered in the middle. So how do you solve that? Well, I solved that a few years ago by doing this. I created another template or another um, another stamp, which was kind of fun. And again, guys, sorry if this is bouncing around a little bit. I'll go back to uh, Art's other question in just a minute. But let's just go with the flow of the conversation. So I created another stamp for myself called Create Draft. And I won't go line by line unless we want to, but let me just show you the output of what that means. So I've got a bunch of variables. And then essentially what those variables are doing is, uh, and then I've got like variables in, you know, in this file, I'm, not, I'm never hiding citation keys. But um, I then essentially what I have Tinderbox do is I say, you know, uh, create a draft folder, create a document, uh, uh, create a folder called v, uh, v drafts, go through, uh, process the document. Then what I want you to do is using the HTML preview command, leveraging using Pandoc, I want you to then render that, take all of the text of this note and drop it into a thing called export string. And so essentially what, what, Tinder, what Tinderbox is now doing is it's grabbing the entire note 
shoving all of that text into a, into a text called export string and then pasting that into another note called draft. So let me show you what happens when I do this. So let's say I, I now wanted to process this note as a, dra as a draft. Mm -hmm. I hit and say create draft. So what I'm, at, what I'm having Tinderbox do is it's automatically created a, um, a folder for me called drafts. Hmm. It's automatically labeled that, that draft with its dates and its numbers. And if I have mm -hmm. the um, preview pan doc real quick to it. Okay. And essentially what it's done is it's take it's, it's looking at all of this input taken all rendered it as HTML and dropped it all oh. into 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 a note called draft. So now this is the complete password manager note. And then gotcha. because, and then because of that, I can now render that note and it uh, Tinderbox will in fact process the um the rendering and then it will drop the references um at the uh, at the end. And this is like one single HTML document, basically. Right, okay. Oh, no, by the way, this didn't work. And, and the reason why this didn't work, and I'll show you why this didn't work. The reason why it didn't work is in this context is I had, I had Tinderbox rendering this note initially as um, as Pandoc, but it needs to be Markdown. So let me go back and I'm going to put that note back to Markdown. This is why I do everything in Markdown. So, okay, so now the note's in Markdown. So now if I say now, and, and now I can produce as many drafts as I want of this particular document as I'm making it work. You are blessed. You oh. love life, your wife, family. It's all sentient beings. So I also have it. I also have Tinderbox give me uh, verbal affirmations whenever I create a draft or publish a document because I work alone all the time and I want people to tell me I'm going to doing a good job. So <laughs> well, <see you. laughs> it's, it's a way for me getting external affirmation when I'm working by myself. So, um, I know it sounds silly, but it actually is surprisingly um, uplifting during a, a busy alone day, right? So you'll see here now I've got, and, and again, I, I've, I've got to play with the display expression. This is a tinderbox file that I I quickly pulled together from another document. So I hadn't like, the note name is actually draft version one, um, but the, the, the display expression is not matching and I haven't bothered fixing it. So, so this is the entire exported note now as HTML in one given file. And so now when I render that, you'll see that the references are now showing up at the bottom. Wow. Because, because Pandoc is now processing this entire draft of the entire note as one note, as yeah. opposed to individual note. And it took me a while to figure out how to do that. But now that I've got it, it's one of those, it's there, it exists, I never need to touch it, and it always works now. Hmm. Amazing. Okay. So now I'm able to, and so I can process a 400 page report in this way and have 500 citations drop at the end of a document. Um, and then I'll just show you the one last piece is because I'm using um, Pandoc, I then can go hit export. And what my export. Um, you are deserving of respect from your colleagues. Right. And that's my other affirmation I get. So I have got about 75 affirmations that it will randomly pick through whenever I take an argument. Um, and let me go to my, uh, here it is, Pandoc SP. Um, and so here is the document that we just exported out of Tinderbox into Microsoft Word. And so if I, if I just wanted to export out the password manager, there is the password manager report. Yeah, great. Super. Yeah. So it totally works. And then if we wanted to do that as an entire document, we could, um, and all of that flexibility. The other nice thing about this too is that in playing around with my templates, you'll notice here that if I were to try to render this document, um, you'll notice that in rendering the password uh, password document, the draft folder is not showing up because what I've done is I've set in my templates and I can show you guys too at the end of the day, if you want to see my templates, I, I have a Boolean in my templates that says is no show title is no show text is no show children. If these Booleans are checked in my notes, then the temp tinderbox export ignores them. So if I were to actually include these and then were to re-render that my template would, is going to actually 
uh, uh, process, and then it will actually render and show those draft notes. And it actually may crash because it's, sometimes it's um, a little too much. But that's how I have that's how I have Tinderbox ignore the draft draft folder. So I can run I can run draft folders as subsets within a larger document and and have Tinderbox ignore it for me. Okay. Yeah, so going back to our markdown discussion here. So now I've got my note such that I'm I'm pulling an export code out of out of these uh, these files. But he, the challenge, though, is if I'm sitting here, you know, I want to be able to render to my client a summary of all of these subsets. And again, I could go off and build an independent template like you guys have seen me do in night and day. But yesterday I had like literally 25 minutes to get this done. So I didn't want to think about context and, you know, is it this is or that's or anything like that. So I just had I used export code like I'm doing here in this context in the note to make sure that I render the note. But before I show you that, I want to show, I want to go back to, um, to um, uh, Art's point. So let's say you had a note called, uh, you know, called test like, like this, Art, do you see that? Yeah. Okay. So let's say, uh, again, this is a, this is a total short-term hack, but sometimes you need to do that because you want to, you know, facilitate your thinking or you need to generate some output like right now and you don't you don't have a you don't have the time to think through how to how to do it efficiently um, sure. uh, say, per se so let's say i've got this note called password manager and i want to render all of the elements of this note in in this one note and there's a variety of ways that you could go about doing that in tinderbox and you'll also note here too is i have i'm gonna i've got smart quotes turned off so that allows me to actually write quotes in the notes without um, without rendering them. So one way to do that would be to use the include. Okay, so I could, I could use include export code, which is that hmm. operator here. And um, I could type the word password managers if I wanted to. And hmm. if there was no other note, and let's, let's just play with that real quick. And let's, let me do this, let me do two things. I'll show you this. And I've got the ID number here too. Um, let me copy the ID number of the note real quick. So I think this, I don't know. I actually don't know if I have another note in this document named password manager. So if I, password managers, right? So if I type the word password managers like this, what I'm telling Tinderbox is to say, include the note password manager. And then I want you to um, render it with a particular template. And let me go wow. down and, and let me go get that template name real quick. Because uh, I can't, I don't want to bother spelling it right. So let's say I want you to render. So render the render the the note password manager using the template T Page Becker R two. And so when I do that, Tinderbox is now going to render that that note and all of its children, because the template T Page R two oh. is, is cascading that out. If I just use my T render template, the T render template doesn't process children. So all I'm going to get is the top level note. Nice. Okay. So that's a wow. really, really, really great way to pull Excellent. content, pull content yeah. in from somewhere else. So let me show you a different mm -hmm. here, but you can also Michael, quick I, question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, here. Is there any way that this will, this include command will, um, parse external um links what do you I'm mean thinking of google docs um or is it only internal no that's only internally oh i got a thumbs down you know no. why i'm asking that mark no no yeah it's only internally now what you what i would what i would do for you is i would do a watch folder and you could put watch on a web page and tinderbox will pull content using the watch the watch feature from a google doc and from that, you then can into a note, and then you can use regex and explode and all of that to parse it out. Where while while you were away, this con, um this topic came up regarding auto fetch, which is under investigation, and what um or auto fetch. Not my watch. problem. Yeah. Sorry, Michael. 
Auto fetch, yeah, not watch. I'm sorry, auto, not a watch folder. Auto fetch. Oh, the auto yeah. fetch we've learned um, will not work presently. Um, uh, but the pro- my problem with it, having a Google Drive locally is, to my knowledge, I can't just have 25 files that I want to watch. It's going to pull in my entire Google Drive. Correct. Right. And, so the, and that's way, just the, too many. Yeah, the, there, there's different ways to do that. You can either create subfolders within your Google Drive. Or what I've done is I've created subfold. I've, I've created folders in Dev and Think. And then have a have a sub sub search algorithm in Dev and Think. So Dev and Think would then only, you know, give me a subset of the other items I wanted to watch. And then from I, Google Docs. And then I have, and you know, yeah, or even from a Google Docs, yeah. And then I have, um, I have uh, Tinderbox watch the Devon Think folder. So Devon Think will filter for you. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Okay, so I, thanks. I, I, that's something I, I, to explore. Uh, so I played with that before. All right. So now let, let me go back to the art arts uh, comments. So another way to kind of piecemeal this together. So let's say I did value. Hey, Mr. Anderson. I I, I you know, you killed a lot of wine last week. I saw. <laughs> exactly. Um, so let's go ahead and we say. Remember, I want to bring in the. You know, we talked about earlier art. We want to bring in the tagline. Yep. Okay. By the way, too. This. Let me go back to finishing the include before I do that. Um, so it turns out I didn't have another note named password manager, and if I did, Tinderbox would start from the top of the Tinderbox document. And it would grab the first note name password manager, right? Managers, right? Uh, and so if I, if what, but what happens if I had multiple notes named password managers, and I mm. wanted the third or fourth one, not the first one? How do you do that? A couple ways to go about doing that. And so let me give you an example. So let's say I created this note here, and let's add some text in here just to show the difference here. So if I go up here and I say that. I'm getting password managers, but I'm not getting the one I want. What hmm. I really want is this one. So the way to go about doing that is you can give it a container. And I just use the display attribute sometimes just to have, I'm not container, I'm sorry, path. I could use the inspector to do this too, but sometimes I find it faster just to do this. So I copy here and instead of using the name of the note, Mm-hmm. I can use the path in the note. Sure. In, in this case, they both have the same path, but you would, in real data, that's unlikely to happen. Well, okay, yeah, for that and that note, let me move it that way. Here we go. Right, and so now, yeah, you're right. I can do that, but I'll show you how to solve that other issue as Mr. Anderson, Mr. Bernstein just brought up. So if I use the path in the note like that now, You'll see that it's now rendering with that that version of password managers, not not. So you can use name of the note, you can use path in the note, but as uh, Mr. Um, uh, Bernstein just suggested, that there could could be a uh, a scenario where they actually have the same path because they're in the same container, and so that's it's not going to know what it's going to do there. And so in that context, this is where I use ID, or you can use ID string. So if I go down here, I don't put it in quotes, and I tell Tinderbox, go get me this note with this ID number, and then render it with that template. And so then if I do that, oh, oh. then I get I get oh, the, yeah. And so I use ID personally all of the time because uh, here I'm guaranteed to get the specific note that I want, no matter what. Right. That's great. Okay. Yeah, and All so right. rapid too. And then you can even get to it through action code. So really awesome at so many levels. All right, so now while we're at it, I can go here and I can say, and let's use the same methodologies. I can do value, uh, tagline. All right, let's say I did that. And I go and render, and I'm expecting tagline to show up here, but it's not. Well, the reasons why it's not is this is saying tagline. Tinderbox is thinking that you want me to have the tagline of the local note. What I could do is say, no, no, no. What I want to do is I want you to get tagline of that, that, that note that is that ID. Okay. 
or you could use it or you could, instead of using the ID number, you could use name or you could use path. Sure. But again, I use ID because it's foolproof. Or you yeah. could use ID string. ID string, right? That's a new one, isn't it? Like it sort it of is. supplants and replaces. It is, okay. yeah. And, and ID string works just as fine too. But again, for ID. me, I got the muscle memory of ID. So I just, I just, yeah. right? Sure. So you'll notice now it's just, inter and it just interjected the tagline of, of, this, of the note that is this ID. So then I can start right. doing the same thing I just doing before. I could say tagline. Category. Um, expectation. Strategy. And that was category. Perfect. All right. All right. And then I give it a space because it's markdown. And now I'm getting those three things. And you know, remember the format. So then you can just. Nice. Come on. Ah, my spell checker is trying to, or trying to look stuff up. Oh, oh, it thinks it's a phone number. That's funny. Mac, uh, Mac, the Mac OS thinks it's a phone number. So it's trying to look it up. Format. That, whoops. I think you have to turn Sherlock off or something for that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, you probably have to do. All right, and then we can keep just doing the same thing. So then I can go down here and I can say, give me the text. Now we've rendered that note just like we had before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So step by step, just rebuilding it. Perfect. Yeah. Very nice. Okay. So, and again, that, and now, now, now let me show you, now I would, I don't see the, you, know, you again, you can do it that using this test note and that value that way, but let me show you a different way and a little bit more advanced. So as I was saying is I wanted, and again, I normally, if I was going to be doing this a lot, which I don't know if I am going to be doing this a lot. So I just did this as a one-off to get the project done. And then if I find myself doing this again, I'd move it into more, consistently used applicable templates and, and remove the structure. So in this hmm. case, uh, what I want to provide a summary to my client. So here's a summary of all of the individual um, active technologies that one might want to use in the form of a table. So I'm saying, hey, Tinderbox, go, go, and again, so you can do the using the, uh, let me just, there is an action code, and this is really, there's an export code called action, which is really nice. So this is the export code called action. So it's it's caret action, parenthesis, everything in between it, and then you're closing the action. And everything in between it in action is essentially ex, uh, um, action code. So oh. now I can write action code in my export code. Um, and you can write action code using export code, but it's a lot more convoluted. So using the, the export code action allows you to write export code. Okay, so everything within the bracket. So everything is within the, here is now going to be triggered as, as export code. So oh, I say, hey, Tinderbox, go create a variable list for me. Create a string for me. Go collect the children and grab the IDs. Then yeah. create a count of the list of, uh, uh, of, the, of, the, um, of those items in the ID. So then I get a, the number of items that are in that list. Then I want you to then go and grab the, and this is fun, go sum the children and grab the lower pricing range, go sum the children and grab the upper pricing range. So I've got total oh. and upper pricing range, and then mm. grab the sum of the children of the pricing range and then average it. And I guess I didn't have to do the calculation again. I could actually just use that variable now that I think about it. Uh, and then so taking that variable and divided it by the count. By, by the other one, right. Yeah, so I didn't actually have to do that calculation again. Then I want you to actually then build me a table. And by the way, this took this took me all of like 15 minutes to write. That's why I was just get it, get it in and done. Then build me mm. a table, give me a row, put in the header rows, then uh, give me the first opening row of each individual item. Then take the list and start iterating through each item. So then what I want you to do is I want for each 
for each oh, come on, for each individual item, I want you to uh, you know first see if there's a note, and if there's a note, then populate the variable v note. Uh, then um, create the row, and then just like you did before, where we said you know value name parenthesis the note ID that we did in export just a minute ago. The the string function is basically doing the same thing. Because remember, mm. in the list, in the list, I said, go get me the ID of each of the each of these children notes. So then in the list operator, what I'm saying is, go get me the name of the note with this ID number. Go get me the name, uh, uh, go get me the, sorry, my, go get me the tagline with the with that note ID number. Go get me the category. Populate the uh, the pricing information. And then down here, I'm saying put in the average averages, average informations, or put in the totals, put in the averages, and then end, end running the action code in the context of this individual note. And then I'm saying, you know, individuals should learn more to adopt these services. And I'll show you something out in, in, in just a minute. So now, if I run this template, Tinderbox dutifully is going through processing all the notes. And so it's now generated me a summary table of each of the individual notes with their tagline, with their fundamental category, with the upper lower pricing, the lower pricing, and the billing period, then calculated the summary for me. So if you were to get all of these tools, it would cost you on average, it would cost you roughly $372 to get all these protection tools every, every month. Plus, hmm. and, and, and the average tool costs about 23 bucks. It's great, and, you're using the, the table to great effect. And then, and then then you can say, here is the summary of each of those different tools. Right. Okay. And then I, and then because I did that here, I was able to copy that code, simply paste it here because all of the variables are the same in the notes. And now mm. I can do the same thing for the, for the passive technologies. Hmm. Make sense? Yeah, it's quite, it's really, really impressive. Okay, now this is where it gets kind of interesting fun too. Then what I did is at the top level of the introduction of the technology adoption section, I did the same function and I said, now go collect the descendants of this particular note, but only if the prototype of the notes are, are P app, because I only want the applications uh, within the descendants of this note. Um, grab their ID numbers, do the list count again, do that sum within this context again. But then you'll see here, look at this. Now here, just like we did the formatting before, I'm now saying you've calculated that number. So now I'm telling you to format it using a dollar sign. And here I'm saying in insert the value of count. Do you guys see that? Yeah, yep, yep. Right. So now when I summarize this note, my entire technology adoption report says, you know, um, the pillar emphasizes the adopting of technologies that given with protection, security, self-actualization, insights and control uh, in the physical and digital uh, spaces. If an individual were to adopt all of the services listed here, count 30. It could cost them between $113 and $928 per month, averaging per service. 37, uh, 32, 77. Yeah, that's great. So as you update or add providers or whatever. Right. So if I add, if I add, when I add new software or tools, Perfect. this yeah. this description automatically gets updated. Makes the document so intelligent and just using variables back and forth. That's excellent. Right. And then I can go run through and then here's my complete summarized document. Great. And you can do whatever you want. You can email this out as an HTML. I can email, email it as an HTML. Yeah. I can push it to a Word file. I can push it into, you know, and then the other nice thing about this too is I then have the capacity to, um, uh, excuse me, let me go like this. And again, this is where it gets fun. I can grab this, highlight that. And, and again, this is where you stop trying to over-engineer things and just get the job done. If I go to PowerPoint, um, if you're ever interested about hearing about my summary, my trip, I could talk about the lighthouse on the top of the world. Um, hmm. 
All right, now I can paste in the table. Whoops. I'll get rid of that header. And reformat the table. Oops. Come on. Oh, come on. Ah. Let me start over. I grabbed too much when I when I pasted. So let me do it again. This. Copy that. PowerPoint. Paste. All right, mm. and this is where it gets, and it didn't grab the whole table, so sometimes I have to, ah, come on. Sometimes I have to do, grab a little bit of extra underneath it, just to make sure I get the, the bottom table tag. Maybe the first word there. Yeah. So I can delete that I don't need that and then I can come on I like that and increase the font uh, Michael right. if if PowerPoint's taking the um HTML that's being read from the preview you might find it easier just to do the copy paste the copy selection in I agree. Yeah. I agree. I agree. But but you'll see here this is where you can just hack stuff together really quickly. So now I've got a table in the PowerPoint that I can then manipulate and make look good and all that. And I'm not having to repurpose that information. All right. But that we don't need to we're not worried about pretty right now. So we can go back to here. So that's the you know, and so now, so in other words, what we're able to demonstrate then today is, um, you know, the use of, you know, chat GPT, the use of um, regex and explode and, you know, um, export code in the body of a note within the context to be able to do that. Uh, while I'm at it, and I can just go sure here too. When I, when I talk about earlier about, I didn't want to bother spending the contextual time if I do know that I'm going to do this kind of operation over and over again, then I would go ahead and embed that include context within my main processing note. So these are the, you know, like, so when I talk about, um, you know, is yes, children equals true. So when I check that box in my notes that says, you know, this, I want you to list the children of this note. What that in fact does is it, um, it takes the notes and, 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 and here, and, then get, and I'll give you a good example of that in just a minute. So if you see here, it says, if the titles, if the title, if, if yes, show title is false, then I want you to show the title of the note. And then if no show title equals false, then I want you to process the children of this note. And so what I was able to do is when I, when I say show a list, and don't show the children. I'll demonstrate what happens to that in just a second. But you'll see here is if the if it says yes equals true to the to the children, then I want you to include this note by applying that this template. And so then if mm. I look at the advanced template, well, what is the advanced template doing? The advanced template, just like using that action code I was showing you before in the, in the text note, you do the same thing in templates. Mm -hmm. I say go go get me a complete list of the notes by triggering hmm. the function list children advanced with the ID of this note. And so then if we jump down to the function of a, um, list, and you see I've been playing around with different versions of it, but hmm. what that list does is it takes the ID number from the note in, in, in question and then goes through and starts processing it and looking at the various variables. Do I want it? Are there URLs? Are there citations? 
Um, hmm. It's going to be a numbered list. It's going to be a bulleted list. And I've also built it so there could be nested children too. So if it's, if there's just one set of children, it does this. But then if you go down here and you say, if, uh, let me just demonstrate it right here. Um, here that says, if yes, children, uh, ch if yes, list children ID. So if one of the children also has a list, I then trigger another function, which then builds a list off of that children. And so I, I've, I've set this function up. So we'll actually go four nested layers deep. So to demonstrate that, um, we can go back here. So let's say, let's say there's some sub features on this note here, note one. And then, you, and you all know I use the, um, uh, I've got a really a lot of different ways of messing around note names. So I've got on visit code. So I've got on visit code that triggers a function that changes the name for me that removes the um, removes the prefixes if necessary. So because there is no on remove trigger, I've got to go back and touch the note so that the on visit tr on visit actually triggers. So if I go in here, watch what happens. So if I say what I what I want to actually do is list. I want when you list the common features, I also want you to list the sub features of encryption data encryption. So when I do that. That, that list function I created actually creates a sub nested list to encrypted notes. And that list, I've set it up so that list can actually be four or five nested layers deep. Wow. Right, and if I don't, and here, here, here's, here's what's kind of fun. If I don't, uh, if I don't say yes, you know, remember I've got my template saying, if no show children is false, then show the children. In this case, it's true. So now if I uncheck that, I can get best of both worlds. I can get the bulleted list and I can get the children. So that's sometimes a way, a quick way to create the uh, a bulleted list of the introduction of a section, and then you can get the details. So there's just a lot of flexibility I've built in my templates to get the output that I want. Michael, I have a question about this. Um, you have values in, in all these different places and a lot of it looks like it's created manually. So I'm kind of wondering about data validation. Um, I could have seen it wrong, but it looked to me, for example, like the summary paragraph values weren't exactly the same as the bottom of the table. And I'm just uh, wondering, and it could be that I misinterpreted it, um, you know, easily, but I'm just yeah, wondering if you have ways that you, that you build in for that. Well, yeah, I mean, that in that context, like you go drop the math, you, you drop the, you could drop this into an Excel spreadsheet and run the math and just double check. Okay. Do you see there where it says 322, but then up on the top, it's a slightly different value. Are where? those the same, meant to be the same? This one and this one? No, no, no. You then go up to your top paragraph. Up here? Above the table. The very, the very, you had a, a yeah, there it is. So see, it says 380. Yeah, because it's taking into account active and passive technologies, both. That's what I wondered about. Okay. So right. when you get into things like that, do you, do you then just confirm it through a spreadsheet or do yeah. you build in or some kind of a, a, a check with the tender box? It depends on the on, on on how quickly I need to do it, you know, and how often I'm going to do it, and do I need the validations in Tinderbox or not? Okay, no. thank you. No. Yeah, it really, it really, it, a lot of that kind of to put the, the way we opened up this call. If you're only doing it thirty times, figuring out the regex may not be worth it. If you're going to do it thirty times a month every month, then figuring out the regex is worth it. So you kind of get to this balance of when do I automate? When do I not automate? When do I, if, and often I'll take the thing up because I know I use this tool so much. If I run into a situation like that 30 times, even though if, if I've got the time, I might as well try to figure out the regex anyway. One, because I enjoy it and it's a way to kind of get my brain working on something else for a little while. Um, and so I often will find myself running, maybe running down a rat hole for a half an hour, 45 minutes. 
And then I'll realize, well, wait a minute, I'm not supposed to be screwing around with Tinderbox right now. I actually should be getting my work done. And then I'll scrap it, go do it manually, and then later maybe figure out how to automate it. And then if it gets really bad, I'll call Mark Anderson and I'll scream help. So All what you're suggesting, if I understand right, is that you'll be the first patient for Tinderbox addiction and I get to treat you? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, but again, it, it, but it, for me, it also falls under this umbrella of not just my incremental formalization of my, of my writing and my thinking, but it's also incremental formalization of my skill development. Right. So I'm constantly incrementally formalizing my skill development. When there's an opportunity for me to test out a regex or to test out a template or to test out writing HTML, if I have the time, I'm going to take that 15, 20 minutes or an hour because that gives me the opportunity to incre incrementally formalize my skill development. Sure. No, it's, it's nothing but impressive. You, you can record me saying that and then you can add that to one of your little sound bites. Yeah, thank thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, <laughs> so we've got this was a completely unplanned script, but uh hopefully you guys enjoyed it today. Oh, it was awesome. I learned so many things and actually getting more and more interest, interested with export code and all the possibilities. The the other for me, the other way to think about export code is and posters, by the way, is export code and posters are a are the ability for you to build views into tinderbox so tinderbox has its eight or nine built-in views export code yeah. and posters that give you the ability to have an infinite number of views of your data whether or not you export it out or not doesn't matter you can use the preview you can use export code as building yet another view so if like for, for one of my other uh, uh in one of my other files i actually built a swat analysis template uh, you know, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats for businesses. And I actually built a table and it would actually generate SWOT analysis output for me. And that was an internal view I generated for this particular project that I was working on to help me analyze the strategy for a business. And I actually, I actually never used it externally. I didn't give it to anybody. It was just for my internal thinking. Hmm. That's great. I'm curious as to whether we could do some kind of like poster, um, like a stock lookup app or environment or something that helps to do analysis of like just goes and looks up live pricing. Uh, I'm so, sorry to say that again. I'm saying I'm wondering if there's a way we can use the posters or um or the uh the fetch the uh, um attribute to say get the value of a stock and then do like a stock analysis using the posters feature. Yeah, so it's like it should be possible, right? Yeah, totally. Okay. I mean, because if you had it, it all, all the posters are is a JavaScript going out and then rendering it in a map. So if there was a uh, if there was a uh, a stock analysis JavaScript function out there, you could easily right. post and then use posters for that. And that's that's what it was built for. Okay, that's what one is hunting for. Then a, a JavaScript. Yeah, you want to be looking like Chart JS. So Chart JS, Plotly. Uh, right. and if you go back to our previous videos in the notes of those, we had like five or six different these open source repositories of these kinds of scripts. Right, right, right. And then right. you okay. just need to feed the appropriate variables out of the Tinderbox attributes into those scripts and you and you got it good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to look dip into that. Sounds so fun. Cool. Mr. Anderson, you had your hand up. Yeah, I was I was just going to reflect on, I think, a, a, a thing uh, usefully raised by by um, Bruce's question earlier, which is that, um, so we can take the room here, we all have different backgrounds, expertise um, in different things. Um, but when faced with something you don't know, it, it's still all magic. Um, and I thought it was, in, the question was interesting in a sense that, you know, well, is there something that does this? And the answer is, well, you sort of do it yourself. The, 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 the you know, I, I would say sort of a core design part of Tinderbox is that it gives you the things to do what you want. It it doesn't do it for you. Now, over time, some things are sort of become encapsulated or some things are just done because they're needed to get you to the thing you're doing. Um, but the more you go off the, the central path uh, of, so, we, you know, and many of the tools, for instance, are there in the export because they were to help with blogging, which was one of the interests at the time when Sotinibox started. Um, but if you just need um, a... Uh, 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 
if you need to sort of do validation of data, you could write some code to do that. Now, when I say, so I mean you in the general, <laughs> I mean, you know, one one would have to sit down or one could ask somebody for help. But the but the approach is that um, no, it's not necessarily there. Oh, I well, think like, that's a... for, like for example, yeah, you know, like to um, to Bruce's point, I could output to a log file the math that those averages and sums are doing. So then I could then actually look at the log file and say, oh, here's the total, here's the here's the average, sum them up. Here are the individual numbers. So all of that, you know, basically, you, you could have Tinderbox do your homework and that, those calculations, Bruce, by dumping the individual elements of the calculation into a log file. And then you could manually eyeball the log file. You know, it, it just occurred to me that having some kind of a little dashboard that looked at your, you know, as you're adding up from different columns, because all it takes is one little typo and you've got data that isn't what you thought it was. Well, and we never do those, right? Ever. Right. Never. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And by the way, Bruce, sorry to interrupt, Mark. The other thing, Bruce, to think about too, and let me actually, let me pop this in and I'll show you, which is kind of fun. The other way to eyeball stuff like this really quick as well, and this is a stupid example, but let's say I go in here and I say show, uh, I'll just do one V-T-O-T-E-R, right? So if I did that, that would actually, oh, and I don't know if you noticed, that would actually, tri oh, I, I typed it wrong, but that would actually trigger Tinderbox to um trigger the values so you could actually use the show operator as a like, i'm sorry where is it where is it showing up in this display so look at the bottom left when i'm done so i i dropped in the right. show operator here so i could actually have each of these individual values pop in and so if you look down here tinderbox is popping up the show operator for that value after it's been calculated you know i'll do it again Right here, bottom bottom left. See that? Or maybe maybe you're off my screen. Um, I only see up to notes. Uh, look at the bottom left of the view pane. Ready? Bottom I'll left of the view. So at the bottom left of my outline list. Okay. Right, right here. Oh yeah. Okay. Yes. Oh, right. very cool. You could trigger the show operator to kind of step through the operations that Tinderbox is doing. And that would be another way to validate what's happening. Sorry, Mark, I inter interrupted you. Do you have anything else to continue to add? Um, to well, it was really just to sort of connect the points of, of, of saying that one of the things that I think we're all prone to do is that because a lot of software is, is written to do a certain task, that what that programs us to do is to color strictly inside the lines and to only do the things we're allowed and therefore ask, what am I allowed to do? And, what, and essentially the core of what's a tinderbox is, is, is a slightly different approach, not to be iconoclastic, but just sometimes you can't guess as a developer <laughs> who's in the room who can correct me. Um, you can't guess everything that people want, but you can give people the tools to do it. So instead and of buying a ready assembled toy, you can buy the, the erector set and you can make the crane for yourself. Right. Whereas the crane it, you get in a box does one thing. If you want a if you want a crane that's a different color, a different shape, you can go make it yourself. And that's the that's the same thing here. So it's a rather hokey way of saying that it's just sometimes to prod oneself to realize that one's probably asking the wrong question. So instead of looking for the where's the button that does X, is to say to yourself, okay. Um, how do I knock myself up a little bit of action code that does X for me? Right. And again, and another great, another the form can help if you don't know. And a great example of that is like 18 months ago, we were using action code, or excuse me, um, Apple script to trigger emails out of Tinderbox. And after enough pleading and whining in the backstage, Mark just built it in for us. And so we no, no longer needed to use Apple script. And so now we can email directly out of Tinderbox. Um, so that's a great example of hacking it together to get what you need done until such a point in time that the cost value ratio for the developer gets recognized to that they'll build that capability in for you. The, the other thing also about making it for yourself is, although it always seems like first more effort the first time around is that um, because most of us sit very close to our own data and our, 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 our data, our problem is not exactly like the person at the next desk over, is that it means that when you're building something, you, unless you're really unlucky, uh, catch most of the weird edge cases 
that might not affect somebody else, but might affect you. So when you're building it in, you tend to allow for these things, the, you know, the, the, the oddities, you know, where you, you know, you know that something, for instance, that you'd expect might not turn up. So you make damn sure you check it. Whereas somebody else who's building the same general function might not think to do it because it doesn't really matter to their output. So it, it's just in a, in a nutshell, it's a slight uh, shift of perspective. And honestly, honestly, Mr. Anderson, for me personally, that has been one of the most important learning lessons of Tinderbox over the last four years is learning to shift the perspective and learning incremental formalization. I mean, the tool is great and you learn these skills and you learn these languages, the red HTML, CSS and all, you know, that fundamental language of the internet, that's all fine and dandy. But honestly, it's that reframing of the way one thinks for me personally is what I brought to everything I do now because of Tinderbox in this community. Mm. And I think, I mean, there's an, a, another a sort of aspect to the same thing is um, Mark uh, put a reply up earlier about the fact that when you were looking at some of the code you were showing that um, a useful thing to do might be to abstract that out into functions, which yeah. is fine if you understand what a function is, but there'll be some of us here who aren't at the stage where a function is helpful because you know, it's all magic code to start with. But if you start to make the code, um, that may be as far as you go, but you might get to the point where you say, okay, I sort of understand what this is doing now. So oh, I'm going making a function. Ah, oh, I can take these 40 lines of code that keep occurring all, all over the place and I can put it in this one place. Now, you know, with much power comes much responsibility because it also gets slightly difficult to debug things because you you mentally have to sort of keep track of, oh, this line actually goes and does this whole host of things. And that whole host of things is stored over, oh, I remember now. So there's always, there's always a slightly different thing to learn, but it's very doable. And the, the nice thing about it is that um, you don't have to. It'll still work, for instance. You don't have to do that sort of abstraction. But you can do the incremental formalization. It sort of cleans things up. And and probably the tell for that is when you're staring at lines and lines of something. So that's a mess. I wish I could just sort of make this a bit simpler. Is probably yourself telling yourself, OK, well, let's either go have a go myself or or go to the forum and say, look, <laughs> I've got this big ball of spaghetti. How do I make it into something I can more easily deal with? And it may be that, you know, for instance, somebody, you know, the forum can show you that. And on in the process of implementing it, you'll get the confidence to go and build one yourself. And then you and then you stepped up a notch. But the but the, you know, the thing won't fail if you don't do that. And it's difficult sometimes watching this, and I say this for people watching this later in the recording, is um, sometimes you see something and there's a sense of, well, I must be doing this. Or, or, clearly, if I'm not doing this, I'm not doing it right. And, and it's a little more subtle than that. Um, because I noted in the, in, the, in the notes earlier up when we were looking at the uh, Michael's code is the thing about, about IDs and paths and things is that for most people, especially those just starting out, name and ID is a good place to start. It's a lot easier when you're trying to think, oh, I got the wrong value from the wrong note to check whether the path or the name was one you expected. Um, however, there are a number of things where I, and, and this got touched on earlier, where using ID just becomes simpler and easier and safer. However, when you're trying to crawl around an odd, odd thing in the code, you're thinking, hmm, is that 10 digit number the one I remember? I can't remember a 10 digit number. <laughs> so, so, you know, again, with much power comes much responsibility. So you'll know when you need to step up because you'll be finding, oh, I'm tripping over odd things to do with paths. Um, I'll just put them into IDs. So well, let, let, um, let be, me, be happy that if what you're doing works, don't feel that if you're if you if there's sort of this extra level of, of abstraction, you're not using. It doesn't matter. But you know, for instance, at the complexity of the stuff Michael's doing, it definitely makes sense. You just don't want to, with the amount of code he's using in his framework, be crawling around dealing with things like mm, have I got an odd character in a path that maybe is not helping me. And, and let me show you a great example of what you just said. So um, one of the things I've been learning about lately is, you know, collaboration with myself. And what that means is like copying and pasting between folders. So Mary Beth and I had devised this naming methodology for uh, figure numbers the other day, uh, which was working great. And essentially, in order to be able to cop, copy and paste 
reliably figure figure numbers uh, within files and between files, um, you know, basically I'm generating this unique name up for a note that's a combination of the figure number and that. And I pasted those over into a different and new file, but for some reason the images weren't resolving and I couldn't figure it out for the life of me. And then I went down and I'll give you a good example of that. And I went down and like a great example of that is a hard coded um, uh, video play number, which is this uh, icon, which is essentially this, right? This little, I this little blue video play icon that I have display when I want to put an inline video within a note. So then it will pop up on YouTube. And Norton so I, was, um, the AI I was copying that image over and for the life of me, I couldn't figure out why it wasn't working. And then it dawned on me that I had hard coded this ID number. And then I realized what happened was I hadn't, I hadn't fully finished my code. So if I went to my, my, um, my on media stamp, where is it? on media stamp, I had to add in this little line of code that says, if ID media is blank, then I want you to create a new media number. So what I ended up happening is because I didn't have this if statement here, when I copied the note over from one file to another, the Tinderbox file would, and then I, the Tinderbox file would take the ID number and then regenerate a new FID for the name. So what I realized is I needed to put the if it's blank so that if it's not blank, then just leave the name as it is. And so now that that lets me copy and paste image files between all of my Tinderbox files and with all of my templates and all of that now works. But that took me a few cycles to figure out how to do. But that's a that's a great example of kind of that incremental incremental step through. And, and, and to solve it is all I need to do is add that if statement and now it all works. All righty. Um, hopefully that last little bit of dialogue was helpful for everyone. Thanks. Thanks so. Really a, uh, great show today. Mark. Thank you. I've, I've got a, I've got a quick question really. It's to try something out for the audience here. So I'll share if I may. I've just been doing some tweaks to, um, Oh, and uh, we have, one, we have one other one too. Mr. Bernstein solved my parsing thing too. Let's show that real quick. Uh, so I think that, so that's there. Share that one. Um, one of the things I was thinking, I mean, I could have done this ages ago, but um, I wonder if this is useful to people. I've just been playing around with the main export template for um, ATB Ref and basically putting backlinks in. So essentially, this this is this is you won't see this in the live pages at the moment. But given that the, the, the uh, resource is written as a hypertext. I I am rather hoping that if people don't understand something, they'll look at the links around them and think, oh, I probably need to, you know, click on that one and read a bit about it. It's also useful to know um, if you're learning, if you're trying to understand something. So, okay, so, you know, since what's he talking about this or what's using that? Um, I, I'd ask those in the room, do, do you think this is a useful um, explanation? I very few pages probably have as many inbound links as this. Um, and if there's nothing, this section just won't appear. But um, would people find that useful? I love it. But my question to you is, how are you doing it? Are they manually put in there or do you have an attribute value? Nope. It's actually done. It's done very, very easily. I will find where it, the... Uh... So um, it occurs a number because this is a very modular template, but effectively... This is what does the magic. So I'm oh, saying, got it. So I got, I've got the text. I'm saying, do I have any inbound? Oops, do I have any inbound links? Which is this. So if I don't, I do nothing. Otherwise, I'm basically just going to open. This is a bit of a hack at the moment for styling. I open a paragraph. I put in a few lines. I'm making, a, I'm making like a sort of like a quasi rule with a line break, and then the next. That's where we have the title. And then underneath it, I use the export code inbound text links. Um, and I spent a merry hour trying to understand why the links turned up because originally I had used... Inbound links? I'd use that, which is inbound basic links. But um, essentially, all the links in Tinderbox are text links. So um, when I put in that, that it magically works. 
Oh, so is text links the links links from internally within the tech the body of the text? Uh, yeah. So let's just um. Nice. Sorry, export codes. So you can find them written about here. So so what I what I had used was um, inbound links. But inbound links is essentially the same as inbound basic links. And the reason there's some duplication is, well, this goes back over 20 years of, of, of some incremental formalization. And in fact, the ones to think about are in, inbound basic links, inbound text links, or we can have outbound basic links, outbound text links, and outbound web links. But um, so essentially the one that I'm the, the one that I'm I'm using is 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 this. In the in the template change, I'm probably going to make, and the next time I refresh the whole site, it will have it. Um, you don't basically you don't have to provide all these if you don't want. So if you just say give me inbound text links, um, Tinderbox will go away, find all the thing, find all the notes that are linked to it, and uh, as shown, uh, do, 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 where did I put it? Tinderbox uh, as shown. Sorry, that's the template um, as shown here. What's actually happening is we are getting a somewhere, 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 getting a list dropped in. So here we go. So that's that that code is all being created for me automatically by the inbound uh, text links export code. So what it does is it makes a bulleted list. So it puts a UL at the beginning and the end. It puts an LI round each note it's found and then basically it makes a hyperlink uh, with a with a link text I'll go back to here so it, it's made the here's the bulleted list uh, and for each item it's it's taking the name of the the note that is linking to this note and making a link to it so if i was to uh click that lo and behold i go to the article on uh quoting um quoting regular expressions. Um, and that's how it's done. So you can see in this case, uh, because it'll be using the same template, I've actually gone to a page that has no inbound links. Uh, or have I? That's correct. Oh, that's it, really because that, 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 that's like a, that's part of the, that bullet regular expression usage is this here. So that's linking to its children because this has a child, it has one child. Um, and if I, if I had inbound links, this is why, this is why I put that little sort of quasi ruler in there because I don't, I don't want this sort of usage to get confused with the inbound links. So the idea is to just have a little listing and indicating that the links are inbound ones, which are not something you'd normally see in a web page, yeah. as opposed to the other. Um, does that answer your question? It does. And let me show you, let me show everybody this. Let me take a. All right. I'll stop sharing. Share. So um, with that in mind, we'll show two other things. So Mr. Bernstein, one, uh, shown an alternative to my regex example, which I'll show in just a minute. But based on what you just said, so I created a link between test and this note. And I typed inbound text links here, just like we were doing with our code earlier, and outbound text links, like, like you just said. And if you preview the notes, there's the inbound links and there's the outbound links. So it works great. So just if people want to see it independent of all of the other code that's in the ATB ref, that's a simple way of looking at that. And then um, while we got this last thing sharing, rather than using regex, Mark wrote this quick little uh, string that, that parsed out that for me. It says my string dot name equals skip to the first dollar sign capture the number, skip to the next dollar sign capture the number, and then skip to the per, and then capture the period. And so then that's how I got. Uh, that, so and instead of doing regex, you could actually do a skip to operator to parse out that string. So that's that's the other thing we discussed. So thanks for that, Mark. That's cool, Mr. Anderson. I like that outbound text link thing. I didn't know about that. That's awesome. Okay. We good for today? Thanks. See you for Jason next week. All right, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Yeah, great, great uh, meetup. Bye.